I use the days between Christmas and New Year to do some basic research work for my DCC booster project. As it turns out, it is more complicated than I thought it would be. Welcome to the world of research and development. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the internet of toy trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use IoT components to control a model railroad layout. Let's get started! DCC boosters and me. That has been a story for quite some years. Here are some pictures of the very first DCC booster I designed. That was back in 1995, almost 25 years ago. Opening it up, we see that it is built around the L298 H-Bridge chip, a device that still is used in booster designs that you find when doing some internet research. Wolfgang Horn, a German author of several DCC and model railroad related books, owned a numerical desktop milling machine and was so kind to make me the PC board and assembled the booster. As you can see, it was specifically made to be used with Direct Drive, which was the software I developed in those days to generate DCC signals directly from the computer's serial port, without using a central unit or interface. That, by the way, was the software that later was bundled as PR1Win together with the Digitrax PR1 programmer. 25 years in electronics is quite a long time, so using the L298 for a new booster design may not be the best of all ideas anymore. In fact, it was not even the best idea back in the days, but using an integrated double-edge bridge building block made it just very convenient. The better way, already back in 1995, would have been using field effect transistors instead of bipolar technology. And in the meantime, there are similar devices like the L298 available using FET technology. One of these devices, the TB6612, was just recently compared to the L298 in a video on the DroneBot YouTube channel. The main advantage of FETs is the significantly higher efficiency, which means more current and lower heat generation. And while this comparison is interesting to study, the TB6612 is of course too weak to build a useful DCC booster. But there are more powerful devices. A very promising candidate is the BTS7960, which can handle currents of more than 40 amps, as a result of a very low on resistance of just a few milliohms. For a typical booster current of 10 amps, this results in a power loss of less than 1 watt, so there should be very little heat buildup. And very convenient with the IBD2 device, there is a ready-made module available for just a few bucks that has everything on board that is needed to build a quite powerful booster. And to make things even more convenient, Dave Bodner from trainelectronics.com has already built a booster using the IBT2. So we can use his design as a starting point and go from there. And if you have not seen Dave's video about his project, I would strongly recommend to watch it. The link is in the description below. Looking over Dave's design, I see some opportunities for improvements. So let's have a closer look at it and understand what he is doing. The DCC input signal is rectified and used as both DCC information and power source for the Arduino. The information pass features a 6N137 optocoupler and the power path makes use of an LM7805 voltage regulator. I decided to modify both approaches. Instead of using the linear voltage regulator, I prefer using a DC-DC converter. I plan on using a more powerful controller and an LED chain, so my onboard power consumption will be higher than in Dave's design, therefore the higher efficiency of a buck converter, as already used in video number 16, seems to be a good thing. 
The optocoupler, on the other hand, can be replaced by a simple transistor design, even simpler than what I have used for my more universal DCC interface. In this circuit, the optocoupler has no isolating effect anyway, as the grounds on both sides of the opto are the same. I assume he was just using the opto for convenience, because he was using an existing PCB design. Continuing on, Dave is using a transistor to generate a negative copy of the DCC signal to drive both halves of the H-bridge. This works well for sure, but makes it impossible to add an auto-reversing feature. So I decided to use a quad XOR gate to do both, creating the inverted signal copy and provide an input to reverse the entire signal with respect to the DCC input. Furthermore, using a quad XOR chip doubles the number of available signals, so I will be able to build a dual channel booster of 2 times 10 amps with auto reverse feature on each channel. The next interesting thing is to look at what happens in case of overcurrent or a DCC signal loss. Dave is using the current measurement feature to watch for an overload situation and then shuts down the power for the entire chip, using GPIO6 of the Arduino. This works for overload, but it does not in case of a lack of DCC input. In fact, if the DCC signal gets lost, there will be a DC voltage on the tracks, which in the worst case can result in runaway trains. So, to have more flexibility, I decided to properly use the enable pins of the IBT2 board so that the microcontroller can shut down the two channels individually as needed. The most interesting thing to look into, though, was the current sensing feature of the IBT2. According to the BTS7960 datasheet, the current sense pin is a current source that is proportional to the current flow in the H-bridge, with a nominal reduction factor of 8500. This means if the current in the H-bridge is 2 amps, the pin supplies a current of 2 divided by 8500 or 0.235 milliamps. There is a 10K resistor on the IBT2 board that converts the current into a voltage that can be measured and evaluated. Now, doing this evaluation is somewhat tricky, and if you check YouTube videos featuring the BTS7960, you see that most people are not using the current sense pin at all. This might be okay when it is used as a motor driver for a drone or something similar, but a DCC booster without overload and short circuit detection, not even to mention auto-reversing, is not thinkable without a way to reliably evaluate the current flow. So I started looking into this problem in detail. The first challenge is interfacing the current sense pins to the microcontroller, in my case the ESP32, which uses 3.3V pins. The current source on the BTS7960 is driven by the high side half of the device, so there will be only one of the current sense pins active at a time, and the two output pins can be combined. As a result, the onboard resistors will be parallel to ground, resulting in a 5K value. The maximum current output on the sense pin is 4.5 mA, which would lead to a voltage of 22.5 volts on the measuring pin, which is way too high, so an additional resistor is needed. I decided on using a 470 ohm resistor in parallel with a 3.3 Sener diode. This gives me a nice measurable voltage range for typical booster currents and a resolution of about 16 mA track current, which should result in a relatively stable current display with increments of 100 mA. The next problem is how to measure the current. When I looked at the signal on the measuring pin, even when the BTS7960 was just lightly loaded, I was somewhat disappointed. The signal has wide ups and downs when the polarity on the output is changing. And as a DCC is a rectangular signal, this is ongoing. The most common suggestion to deal with that problem 
is using a low pass filter to eliminate the spikes. So I tried various capacitors, unfortunately only achieving incremental improvements. And when filtering away a lot, the reaction time for short circuits became just too long. Interesting to see how Dave is dealing with that problem in his design. He is using a real huge low pass filter implemented in software by averaging the results of 400 measurements. This results in one measurement in about 45 milliseconds, which therefore includes about 7 complete DCC packages. Consequently, he gets long reaction times for overload detection and has to rely on a single peak pulse measurement to do short circuit shutdown, which again makes it vulnerable to false triggers due to short pulses. Not really satisfactory, but then how can this be improved? In the oscillo screenshot I noticed that the spikes in the current sense signal result from the polarity change of the DCC signal. After this, the signal is relatively stable within about 200 millivolts. So if we could synchronize the timing of the measurement with the DCC signal to avoid measuring those polarity change effects, the result should be pretty reliable. So the challenge is to place a measurement at a defined point within a DCC bit of 52 microseconds for the 1 bit and 104 or more microseconds for the 0 bit. And then keep that rhythm even though the sequence of zeros and 1s is constantly changing with the data. And ideally it would be possible to measure not only once in a cycle but several times and then take the average. The best way to synchronize the measurements with the DCC rectangular signal is using an interrupt that gets triggered when the signal is changing. That's exactly how DCC decoding works. So I took the Arduino NMRA DCC library as a basis and modified it to provide a hook for my measurements. The first thing I did is adding a flag to the interrupt service routine that is raised every other time the interrupt is triggered. Then I created a separate task that is waiting for this flag to be set. Then it measures the current of either booster A or booster B. The measurement is repeated a total of four times, but only the last three results are averaged. The first result is crept, as it is too close to the inrush peak of the current sense pin to be reliable. But I am doing a measurement anyway, as it keeps the task busy and therefore maintains the timing better than sending the task to sleep. An analog read on the ESP32 takes about 10 microseconds as it is internally doing several port reads and already calculates an average value. So with 4 readings and a small time offset to get started, it pretty much takes the available bit time of 52 microseconds, leaving the other half of the bit for signal processing. The result is then reported to the main sketch using a callback function for each channel. And the callback function reports the incoming value to the booster object. This whole process is repeated typically about 6500 times per second. Each channel gets measured every other bit in one half of the bit. So my minimum reaction time for short circuit shutdown or reverse mode activations will typically be about 100 to 200 microseconds depending on whether it happens on a 0 or on a 1 bit. And of course I can slow it down in a very controlled way in the software. Here is how this looks like on the oscilloscope. Red is the DCC signal measured at the output of the XOR chip, which is the DCC input of the ESP32. And blue is an IO pin of the ESP32 that I programmed to change level immediately before calling the analog read function. So we can see the four read operations each taking about 10 microseconds. As expected all measurements take place in one half of the bit and the measurements are switching between channels A and B from bit to bit. And what also can be seen 
is that the timing remains stable, even in the case of consecutive 1 bits, as it is the case during the DCC preamble, where we typically see 21 bits without interruption. The next picture shows the same, but this time the DCC signal is taken at the output of the booster, so the signal is now delayed a few microseconds because of the booster reaction time. We see that the first measuring point, therefore, is closer to the rising flange of the DCC signal, potentially interfering with the inrush spike of the current sense pin. That's the reason why I skipped the first measurement and only average the following three. And again, we can see that all four measurements conveniently fit into the 52 microseconds of one half of a one bit. And in the case of a zero bit, the measurements happen at the exact same time with respect to the polarity change of the signal, which is important for a consistent measurement. Finally, a comparison of measuring points with the current sense signal Again, we can see that the first measurement might be affected by the effects of the polarity change, while the next three events clearly fall in a phase where the signal is relatively stable and we can expect a quite reliable and consistent measuring result. And using a slower time base, we can see the measurements performed on both channels. The timing adapts nicely to the different bit lengths, no measurement is lost, so it looks this is a very stable way to determine the booster current when boosting a DCC signal. So I went on and checked the output of the analog digital converter when loading the booster with different loads. I basically used two automotive headlight bulbs and 12 volts from a regulated power supply. I put a multimeter in the current pass between the power supply and the booster. Depending on how I connected the lamps, I could draw currents between about 2 and 11 amps, which is a very realistic range for a DCC power booster. Of course I had high expectations based on the results seen in the oscillo shots, but then I was certainly aware that there are at least two non-linearities in the system that I cannot control. The first is the amplification factor of the BTS 7960 which can change from chip to chip. The datasheet gives a potential range from 3000 to 14000 for currents of 5 amps. That's a lot. The other unknown is the analog digital converter of the ESP32, which according to some publications is not that linear over the entire measuring range. So with that in mind, I was really keen to see the correlation charts between measured current on the multimeter and the results measured on the ADC of the ESP32. And as you can see here, it was flabbergasting. Clearly better than expected. Practically a straight line from the low to the high currents. I repeated the series of measurements with all four IBT2 modules that I have available and all of them gave very consistent results. The only strange thing I noticed is that two of the modules only start working when the current is higher than about 2 amps, while the other two provide results all the way down to zero. This is strange. I verified all soldering joints on the modules and measured the onboard resistors but could not find any difference. So at this point in time I don't know what is causing the difference and more research is needed. Also I noticed that the current amplifier factor really is different on each module. So for the final hardware version I need to plan for a potentiometer so that the measuring range can be calibrated. I also make the conversion factor configurable in the software. With that I will, it will be possible to set the zero detection point using the potentiometer and then use the software factor to, to determine the slope of the conversion curve, which should result in reliable current measurements over the entire range of 0 to 15 amps with a precision of 100 milliamps. Overall, this looks very promising to me. Ok, that's it from the lab for today. With those research results, I hope I will be able to build and present a working two-channel 
15 amp booster in just a few weeks time. I'm pretty sure you would like to see that, so it is probably a good idea to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you have a premium seat when the next video is released. For today, let me just summarize the learning points. Bipolar H-bridge drivers are significantly less efficient than FET based ones. They are therefore most useful for low current applications. Using an optocoupler to separate power and information of a DCC signal is possible, but normally not necessary. In most situations, using just a regular transistor is the better option. The primary use case for an H-bridge is amplifying a PWM output to drive a motor. Using it to boost DCC signals with constantly changing polarity is less common, but it works. The current sense pin provides a current source that outputs a current that is proportional to the current in the H-bridge. But there are some non-linear effects to it when polarity of the bridge changes. Therefore, the evaluation of the current source within the first 10 to 15 microseconds after polarity change may lead to wrong results and should be avoided. In order to get good current measurements, the measuring points should be synchronized with the DCC signal. This is more reliable than using a low-pass filter or just averaging over a relatively long period of time. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If so, please drop me a like below. Thanks for watching and see you soon.